Leading our discussion and welcoming our guest is Riley Walters, Research Associate in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy. Prior to joining Heritage, he was also a Research Associate at the Capital Enterprise, uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Excuse me. He is a graduate of George Mason University, where he earned his bachelor's degree in economics. Riley, welcome to church. <laughs> uh, good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Um, the discussion on the act of cyber defense is emerging and uh, therefore, I believe, an exciting topic. And I can't think of anyone better to talk about this than Professor Scott Jasper uh, and the launch of his new book, The Strategic Deterrence, Active Cyber Defense Option. Uh, so Scott Jasper is a uh, retired captain of the U.S. Navy and lecturer at the Center for Civil-Military Relations and the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval Postgraduate School, specializing in defense capability development and cybersecurity. Scott is well published with articles in, uh, in the Joint Force Quarterly, the uh, Strategic Studies Quarterly, the Diplomat, Defense News Magazine, Marine Corps Gazette, and the Partnership for Peace Consortium, of Defense Academies, Quarterly Journal, Connection, to name a few. <laughs> um, he is the editor of Conflict and Cooperation in the Global Commons, uh, Securing Freedom in the Global Commons, and Transforming Defense Capabilities, New Approaches for International Security. He is also a PhD candidate at the University of Reading, UK. And uh, with no further delay, I, will, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Scott Jasper. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you very much for attending today and for taking the time out of your schedules to be here for the next, say, hour to discuss a very important topic. I know it's a beautiful day outside, and I'll do my best to make this worth your while in being here. There's no doubt that cybersecurity is front page, and all I have to do is pick up the front page, and so we can look at the attacks that occurred yesterday, business and finance, cyber attacks spread across the globe. So the real question is what can be done and what has been done in order to deter actors that are operating in this domain. So the book that will be out in about three weeks, I was proud to say, uh, by Roman and Littlefield, uh, addresses many of these ideas and what can we do and what is the opportunity that lies ahead. So what I'd like to do today is set the foundation for a discussion here with some prepared remarks and, of course, take your questions, uh, which I would believe there'll be quite a few, given the importance of this domain. So we'll think first about the idea of deterrence. And I define deterrence really in the book in two different ways, one way through the military lens and the second through an academic lens. And I'll start today with the military lens, which I'm somewhat more familiar with, as Riley said, from my military career as a Navy captain. Uh, but also, of course, I've been at the Naval Postgraduate School for 15 years now, and I've hopefully transitioned a little bit away from that. Deterrence is defined in Joint Publication 5.0 as the prevention of adversaries and desired action. And you might know the strategy works in the mind of the adversary to change their perceptions of cost and benefits. Therefore, the aim of deterrence is to decisively influence the adversary's decision-making calculus. Deterrence strategies of denial, retaliation, and entanglement, which is implemented primarily through norms of responsible behavior seek to convince adversaries not to take those undesired actions. They concentrate primarily on means to deny benefits, to impose costs, or to encourage restraint. If effective, an adversary chooses not to act for fear of failure, risk, or consequence. Deterrent strategy is not mutually exclusive, and US doctrine, for example, uses a mix of methodologies across diplomatic, legal, economic, and military dimensions. The book finds that traditional deterrent strategies are insufficient to deter the wide range of malicious actors operating in cyberspace. And I characterize those in four categories. First, the nation states. Second, the hacker groups. Third, the terrorist groups. And fourth, the criminal organizations. And to some extent, they, many of them do work together. State capabilities to influence the behavior of these actors in cyberspace are constrained by their ability to operate with anonymity, impunity, and deniability. Even if the attacker is rational, their motivations to achieve political objectives, national pride, personal satisfaction, and monetary gain, or through cyberspace are not easily deterrable. 
So in response, the book offers the strategic option of active cyber defense that combines internal systemic resilience with tailored disruption capacities. The strategy actually supports denial by making it harder to carry out a cyber attack. And it supports retaliation by providing more options to inflict punishment, the other version of deterrence by retaliation. It also enhances adversary propensity for restraint, irregardless of the character or number of actors to be deterred. Again, there's a wide array of actors. How do we address all of them? Active cyber defense itself involves synchronized detection, analysis, and mitigation of network security breaches, which means inside the network combined with aggressive use of legal countermeasures deployed outside the network. So two aspects of active cyber defense defined in the book uh, through the sources that I use. So the book starts by looking at the various actors, as I started to describe, and their methods of attack. It provides technical detail and vectors, attack vectors, for compromise of information and communication systems. And it looks at very common act vectors, such as spear phishing, water hole, point of sale, web applications, and distributed denial service. Then examines the doctrine capabilities of nation states to include North Korea, Iran, China, Russia, oh yes, and even the United States is included in that nation state set. It also, as I said, looks at hacker groups, including hackers for hire, other types of groups such as anonymous, and criminal organizations, and terrorist groups such as ISIS. And it uses recent incidents and campaigns. So the book is, has a theoretical basis in strategy and deterrence, but it has a practical application across numerous cases that I'll talk about, numerous incidents. I analyze those in order to make the points uh, for the book itself. So it has technical depth. So the book will look at the utility and sufficiency first, next, of deterrent, deterrent strategies. Again, retaliation, denial, entanglement for influence in malicious actor behavior in cyberspace. So if you're aware of deterrence, you would understand that for deterrence to be effective, it has to have three essential elements. It has to have the capability, possess the means to influence the behavior, change the mind of the adversary. It has to have credibility, instill believability that actions will actually be deployed, not just threat. And communication that the right message would go to the desired audience, the ones you're trying to change the minds. Achieving these conditions for the wide array of actors operating in cyberspace is extremely difficult. Obviously, one approach doesn't fit everybody I'm describing here. But they're all attacking us, us being the United States, coalitions, partners, industry, government, et cetera. So we have to defend against them. We have to deter them. So what I'd like to do now is just talk about the three traditional types of deterrence and what I examined, and then take you into discussion on active defense. So we'll talk, we'll start with deterrence by retaliation. It is defined as the effort to impose costs for hostile acts, and we can apply that then to cyberspace, hostile acts in cyberspace. The book reviews the utility of ways to impose costs, such as military cyber operations, diplomatic engagements, law enforcement measures, economic sanctions, and yes, the use of kinetic capabilities, to change an actor's perceptions under varying conditions and in circumstances. It looks at the challenges of military response options to include cyber weapons selection and usage constraints, both in the context of armed attack and the context of armed conflict. It also considers the virtues of these other response options in a whole of government approach. The book centers on the use of a comprehensive approach where we bring together all elements of power to address this threat. The book finds that retaliation does not meet the conditions of deterrence given a tolerance for risk in malicious actors generated from government hesitancy to use all necessary means. In other words, our responses are watered down to the threat. They're not even proportional. So we can't change the behavior through this strategy. The second strategy that I'll look at in another chapter would be called deterrence by denial. That would be defined as the effort to hold, withhold hold any benefit from attack, from activity in cyberspace. And therefore, over time, you get a perception that attacks are pointless endeavors. Therefore, why would we do it? we being the actor, if we're not going to succeed. The book examines the utility of protective measures designed to reduce risk. It begins with a defense in depth strategy that places a preventative and protective security controls informed by cyber threat intelligence across what's called the cyber kill chain. And I explain that in depth, all of, of course, those terms, which we can discuss if you'd like. 
Next evaluates what are called security controls and security control frameworks to institute industry best practices and security solutions. The NISC cybersecurity framework is an example of that sort of framework. Critical security controls, produced originally by the SANS, now the Center for Internet Security is an example of, of security controls. It talks about those. It also reveals whether threat intelligence sources of information sharing arrangements can stay ahead of the threat. The book concludes a denial does not meet the conditions of terms given the apparent ease by which malicious actors are able to penetrate systems with low-cost, readily available attack tools, such as those on criminal forums that can be purchased or rented. The third element, then, would be deterrence by entanglement. How many of you have heard of the word entanglement and deterrence before? One or two? OK. So that's basically a term taken from space, from space deterrence, in thinking about how we are dependent we being nations on space and the services of space. The idea there would be, why would we blow up a satellite in space, we being a nation state, if we're all dependent on space for the capability space generates? So the way that's regulated is by, for example, codes of conduct, norms of responsible behavior. And in space, the EU has attempted to do this somewhat stalled their initiatives, I would say. About a year ago, they announced that. So we can transition that into cyberspace. And the United States government, uh, the UN government group of experts has attempted that by building norms for the last couple of years uh, with the United States in that lead. So the book looks at those norms, looks at these called cooperative measures. Other things too, confidence building measures, capacity building systems. Can those restrain state behavior? In conducting, endorsing, or allowing malicious cyber activity originating from your territory. In other words, why does a nation state not control their territory with the actors, the bad actors that are doing harm to other nations? Examples then, it looks mostly at international law, but it also starts with the idea of arms control, formal binding obligations, whether or not those would be sufficient in cyberspace. How do those apply? It looks at the great work that's been done by many individuals, including the State Department here in the United States, to promulgate these norms. However, it concludes that those don't meet the conditions of deterrence because of state objectives, views, and values regarding the use of cyberspace. Those diverge. We can't cooperate. Responsible behavior then is constrained. So in response to these shortcomings from these three traditional deterrence strategies, the book explores whether active cyber defense is technically capable and legally viable to act inside the network, again, for internal systemic resilience and outside the network by tailored disruption capacities. So again, I said the book uses law. And the law that I normally re that I refer to repeatedly is generated through the Talon Manual. How many of you have heard of the Talon Manual? A few. OK. So you might be aware there's Talon Manual 2.0 that was actually released in, say, April time frame. I was very fortunate to be able to put in the book updates to the very end. I was able to get the latest version of the Talon Manual 2.0 in the book. I probably cite it 50 times because it is very authoritarian knowing the lawyers that created it, including Michael Schmidt, who has reviewed this work. The Talon Manual Rule 20 says a state may be entitled to take countermeasures in thinking of active cyber defense, whether cyber in nature or not, in response to a bleak breach of a national legal obligation that is owed by another state. That's a quote. Okay. So what is a breach of a legal obligation? Well, for example, it could be a breach of an international treaty, such as the use of force. Or it could be a breach of customary law, such as sovereignty for a nation, the rights that you have generated. Furthermore, believe it or not, the Talon Manual 2.0 states, quote, there is no prohibition against interstate turning to a private firm, including foreign companies to conduct cyber countermeasures on their behalf against responsible states. Unquote. So yes, a state under these legal conditions can use a private firm, even a firm outside their country. But that country, that firm would still be uh, held to the rules of engagement under the Talon Manual. So what then is the difference between countermeasures used by, say, an injured state under law, international law, and the controversial term hackback? Okay. So hackback is when the victim acts on its own initiative to stop an ongoing attack by intentionally assessing a protected computer without authorization. 
In the United States, the company decides a hackback might face criminal and civil liability other than the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, codified as Title 18, Section 1030. The right to hack back in self-defense, or more appropriately, the defense of property, could, though, be justified if traditional law enforcement schemes are inadequate to respond, or if attacks fall below the threshold of or capacity for government response. An argument could be built on that. So in the book, what I did is I looked at all of the options, the constraints regarding hack back, the laws, international and domestic. And I came to the conclusion that hack back should only be used by, quote, licensed private companies under the supervision and approval of proper authorities, such as the Department of Justice under CFAA Section 1030F exceptions in certain authorized scenarios, unquote. And we can talk, if you'd like, about what would be some of those scenarios and what would be some, say, a sliding scale of actions that could be used in hackback against the various actors that I actually allude to in the book. But I do recognize that hackback outside the networks brings a whole plethora of concerns. Foremost is the motivation of organization, the misattribution of the attacker, third-party collateral damage, and potential escalation out of control. Therefore, the book also emphasizes the use of automated integrated capabilities inside the network, inside organizational boundaries, which would be legally viable. Those would be informed by cyber threat intelligence, the hall threats, again, across the cyber kill chain. So when you look at the cover of the book, uh, you'll see it's somewhat colorful. Obviously, I use the Kremlin. I was enamored, as many, by the DNC hacks. And I was able to bring that into the introduction and conclusion, use it as the case study to open the argument and to close the argument on the use of hackback. I do cover throughout the book a number of other cases. In the retaliation chapter, I look at Sony. I look at how the United States resorted to limited sanctions against a regime already heavily sanctioned for its missile nuclear test. I look at the Office of Personnel Management hack, OPM, how we had a failure of legacy systems and leadership in what became a two-phase attack. I describe in somewhat detail the actual evolution of the attack by the two actors. An entanglement, I look at the centerpiece that we would say today is a success, and that would be the US China cyber agreement that was reached between the two presidents a little over a year ago. However, we must recognize that Director Clapper testified in January 2017 that Beijing continues to conduct cyber espionage against the US government, our allies, and US companies, although at reduced levels. So therefore, there's been success in that agreement, however, potentially not as much as we had hoped. It also is a note that many industry sources say the attacks are continuing, we just can't see them. They're more clandestine, more covert. So after looking at, again, the chapters on the traditional strategies, the case studies to define the attempts that we've done and the methods and the initiatives, I would then turn to active cyber defense. Now, in the active cyber defense chapter, what I looked at was the target breach. Okay? How many of you were impacted by the target breach? Too many? You didn't change your credit card or debit card? I did. My wife used our debit card at the Target in the window. So I immediately went to the bank and changed the debit card. Okay. So Target obviously reached upon 70 million Americans. Maybe you in the room are not one of them. But it was a very watershed event because it really brought to the boardroom the significance of cyber attacks and the, the need to defend against that. So what I did in the Target breach was looked at, of course, how it all occurred, which we could talk about if you wanted. But how could we defend it with integrated automated capabilities? So this is where the book starts looking at what are the solutions out there today? What are being produced by industry? And I do cite them by name, I will say. And I attempt not to, quote, endorse them. But I want to identify what they can do. And I'll talk about a couple in detail here. In the target breach inside the network, it's interesting to note that what the actors did was they collected the data and eventually transmitted 11 gigabytes of stolen information. They collect it into internal servers, okay, across those point of sale machines that individuals are swiping those cards at. Okay, that was that data was unencrypted at the time of swipe in random access memory. They grabbed it and they moved it to these servers, and then at odd hours they sent it away to uh, external uh, file transfer protocol servers. Okay, it's so all being done inside a network, all being collected inside the network until it left. According to the cyber kill chain, what we would consider is that they were working toward get to number seven 
in the phase of action and objectives. And all we had to do is defeat them anywhere before they sent the information away, and the damage would not be done. Okay? So there's plenty of opportunity to do that. So for example, I worked with uh, Light Cyber Magna, which is a company recently bought by Palo Alto I'll talk about. And they confirmed they would have had the capability to see the movement of the data across the network. Okay? They looked for lateral movement. They also would have blocked the transfer uh, to an XDAR uh, file transfer platform. They would have detected the anomalous large uploads to send it out across those servers. So a system working inside the network would have many opportunities to block the attack, to prevent the damage. This is the first indication I found of, of uh, one of these platforms being able to uh, defeat the attack. The second example that I use in the book is the fact that Target knew that they were under attack, but they just couldn't react to it. The security analysts from a FireEye device had an alert on the malware in the system, but they had hundreds and thousands of malware alerts, and they couldn't ascertain which one was malicious. So as an example of another platform called Hexus, an active cyber defense solution, would see that and do a threat scoring of it and bring it to a recognition that that was a threat to detect on it and then take automated or man-in-the-loop actions on it. So Target gave me initially a way to look at two technologies that are active, that are promulgated today or fielded today. And then finally, DNC. So in the conclusion, again, I look at the DNC. I look at whether what we could have done in the DNC. I look at how deterrence was ineffective. Uh, the Washington Post article from, say, last Thursday, Friday, if you did read that by chance, gave some 35 pages of discussion on that as I tried to print it out. Uh, and we can go through any of that as you choose. But the key would be all the things basically failed. Okay? We really didn't deter the Russians. And we didn't deter the Russians from, for example, attacking the French right during the campaign. If you're aware that they grabbed files from one of the campaigns, Macron, and then posted that to the internet to try to discredit him, as they attempted to do with, uh, or they potentially successfully did, with uh, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. So, uh, so we did not deter them. So where did active cyber defense work? Well, it can work earlier in the activity. If we can defeat the activity inside a network, okay, and basically, again, block the exfiltration, we wouldn't be here today talking about Russia and what they did in the election. In the DNC attacks, once the DNC in April of a year ago saw some signs of an intrusion, they called CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike, within 24 hours, was in their network and could see the two actors, the two Russian affiliated actors. They could see them moving through the network. And the damage had already been done, and the files had already been stolen. They were still in the network, though. Uh, but the point being is if CrowdStrike had had any authority or the tools in place, they could have potentially blocked that earlier Okay, before the exfiltration. Those actors have been in their fancy bear for about a month. Uh, Cozy bear have been there since the previous summer. There's plenty of opportunity to find them and defeat them if the technologies had been in place. So those case studies we can talk about if you'd like, or if you have any questions on that. We can talk about the French, too, by the way, a little bit on that, because they actually went outside the network uh, with a deception campaign. But what I thought it might be kind of fun and is to talk about ransomware for a minute. And this is where I'll conclude and then take questions. So what I really see about the book is not just the application to the strategies and what we've done and what we could do, but what can be done for the future in this series of attacks. And it's amazing, of course, that uh, the actors continue to repeat themselves as we look at the cyber attack that happened yesterday. But I thought it might be fun for a few minutes, my version of fun at least, to talk about WannaCry, okay, and, and what occurred there, and where did, would active cyber defense apply in WannaCry, okay? And when I get caught up on this Petra, not Petra attack, I'll be able to analyze that too, okay? But WannaCry is very important because of potential connection to North Korea, okay, at a government level. So I think it's important from a case study to look at that. It's not just a, a maybe a criminal act attempting to collect money. It could also have been a state act, a sponsored act. So we'll look at that here for a few minutes, if I might. So what you might know is that researchers found identical code in a WannaCry sample in Canopy, a backdoor program used by the SARS group, believed to be really closely affiliated with or even identified as North Korean Bureau 121. Previous code fingerprints had already tied the SARS group 
to the disruption of tax on South Korean banks and media stations in 2013, the, the wiping of drives and data at Sony, and also the recent compromise of the SWIFT network used to transfer funds between the national banks. So if North Korea is behind WannaCry, obviously previous efforts by the United States for deterrence by denial and retaliation have failed. Destructive attack on Sony, the actors actually were in the networks over two months, mapping, moving, stealing the data, the files, the movies, and so forth, the emails, before they activated Dustover, which basically started to overwrite their computers and, uh, and cause damage. That was in November, if you might recall. Publicly, the FBI attributed the hack to North Korea. Treasury respond to the department eventually imposed financial measures on a number of organizations and officials. But again, these same measures have failed in other ways with North Korea when you think about missile and nuclear tests. So what can we be done inside, outside the network? What could have been done in WannaCry? All right. So let's start with the idea of the law again. What is the basis for response? Well, in the case of WannaCry, the ransomware disabled systems and critical infrastructure. There were hospitals, of course, in the UK, about 16 of them in the national health system. And there were also railways that had some disabled, uh, some, uh, some aspect, uh, in Russia and also, for example, in Germany. Okay. So technically, a state could have invoked a violation of sovereignty and use countermeasures, but that is if they were able to attribute to the responsible state under national law. Semantics said there was no technical evidence to prove the SARS group was acting on the behest of a nation state. The NSA a couple weeks ago said, well, we believe that cyber, cyber actors are suspected to be sponsored by the Re Re Reconnaissance General Bureau. So publicly suspected by. That doesn't appear to be very finite attribution. Because international law says for you to employ countermeasures, uh, you have to have the criteria of under the instructions of or under the direction or control of uh, the government, like North Korea. And this was somewhat of, a, somewhat of a problem, by the way, in the Washington Post article. If you were to read through that, you would realize that, that conclusion of direction control was still not necessarily met. So if the law is inconclusive, what about the plea of necessity? Well, in theory, a state can affect that for a grave and imminent peril to essential interest. Maybe the critical infrastructure could have been considered that, like a hospital. Again, termination under law. So in thinking of the state acting in some form of what would then actually be retaliation of countermeasures, that's restricted. Did denial work? Well, in WannaCry, no, because those companies didn't install the patch and were using older operating systems. Okay? And what about entanglement? Norms. Would North Korea agree to any norms? Well, obviously, they're not party even the construction of those. They're not going to agree to those. Right? So what other option is there? That option is active cyber defense based on promise inside a network to automatically detect, verify, or remediate cyber threats. So we need to operate at cyber speed. And I've been working with the National Security Agency Information Assurance Directorate and John Hopkins Applied uh, Physics Lab, who I met with yesterday, on a new architecture, integrated architecture, that would do just that. How do we field capabilities across networks to act as quick as the attacker that are automated? So these actors in WannaCry did automate their attacks. They used Metasploit to scan the networks to look for vulnerabilities, which this article says Petra did not, by the way. But they found those vulnerabilities, the SMB vulnerabilities on exposed ports, ports 445, OK? That allowed them to load the external blue exploit, the one the shadow brokers released from the NSA, right? Which is believed to be used also in this cyber attack here, this ransomware attack, Petra. Okay. That allowed them to install a backdoor called Double Pulsar, another NSA exploit, okay, to load the WannaCry malware. Just following the steps of the kill chain. Okay. They executed eventually the encryption phase, and uh, off they went. So what I've been trying to do lately is think about, well, is this really feasible? Like, isn't as the book says. So I've been working with Palo Alto Networks in Silicon Valley on a project tied to, again, the John Hopkins uh, that has installed some of their devices in the postgraduate school. And I work with them to try to think about how would they have blocked WannaCry? How would they have acted? 
Well, a simple way was the firewall. Now, the exploit was already known, right? That was published, okay, along with the uh, patch. So if you know the signature, you can just load it into your firewall. For Palo Alto, that's the next generation firewall. And then you block it right there. Okay. What if you don't know the signature? This is the problem. Okay. So if you don't know the signature and it gets into your network through spear phishing or something like that, then what starts to happen is processes start to execute across the network. The malware starts to act. So for Palo Alto networks, they have what's called traps. And there was a process called DLL, which was activating inside of the WannaCry that they would have caught through traps that they test to. Palo Alto Networks also acquired LightCyber, the one I earlier talked about. Okay? LightCyber would have done the same thing. With their Pathfinder, they would have looked at the process execution on the endpoints. They would have also looked at the mapping of the drives in the encryption, and they would have looked at the command and control, the outbound communications, part of the kill chain, in order to detect the attack. Okay. So basically, it's important to note that if you put these in place, you could potentially block the attack. Because again, we don't really know the motivations of these actors. If WannaCry was tied to North Korea, what was their motivation? Was it to collect money? Some people would say it was. Cash generation. Some academics that I've recently spoken to and presented have said that. All right? But really, they didn't generate a lot of money in WannaCry. If you follow that, they generate somewhere between 125,000, But the problem is they can't actually retrieve it because of following it on the Bitcoin ledgers, it's obvious who is pulling it. So they actually haven't made any money. They could have done it to prove, they being North Korea, that they have this capability, all right? Signaling. So the virtual active cyber defense is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter inside a network, at least, who is doing this. You just block the actor. It doesn't matter if it's criminal, if it's nation state or not. So, WannaCry could have prevented, in the case of WannaCry, active cyber defense could have prevented the adversaries and desired actions. So to wrap up, I said I'd look at an academic at the end and the government at the beginning. I'll quote Thomas Schilling. He stated that the deter is prevent from action by fear of consequences. Evidence today indicates traditional deterrent strategies, even if applied together, are not instilling fear in actors. There's no consequences. So another strategy is necessary encourages adversary restraint by changing perceptions of costs and benefits in a different way. The book shows that active cyber defense meets the conditions, capability, credibility, and communications to be considered for selection as a strategic option for deterrence in the cyber arena. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, great. Um, so we're going to take some uh, questions. I'll let you field them uh, as you will, uh, but I will take the prerogative of okay. those to ask the first one. Um, you've definitely talked about the importance of network resiliency, right? which is uh, important. I wonder if you could expand on uh, a topic you briefly mentioned, which is attribution, right. and how active cyber defense can help, perhaps, in dealing with actually finding out who is behind the attacks. Um, um, your thoughts? Right, right. Um, well, I appreciate the, uh, the mention on resilience. And one of the things I didn't talk about is for the Department of Defense, resilience has become a key element of their strategy. I would like to key upon that and then identify that in the book. And internal systemic resilience is then built upon that. Um, the idea of starting to work outside the network, the question is, of course, can you start to attribute the lo uh, to the actor or at least the location of the actor? And this is where it starts to get controversial, because if you're considering going after the actor, for example, trying to retrieve files, which I, I mention in the book, but I do cite the task force conclusion that, that came out at, uh, in the fall, that that's skeptical in order to find those, unless the files are collected somewhere, okay, like on a server. One of the things that I, when I went back and looked at the book is that uh, the, in the target case, the FireEye software actually saw the addresses of the servers external that the files were being collected on and sat on. So the question could have been, well, could you have gone after the files on that server, say in Malaysia somewhere, before they went to Eastern Europe? So the question would be, start to trace back. And I start to talk in the book about traceback technologies. I have a section on that in the book. Uh, the attribution side would be very challenging, though. And uh, there's a couple ideas that I put in the book in the sliding scale of actions. 
the first one, which is very unique, is the idea of putting some malware in the files before they're stolen that would infect the computer and uh, uh, activate the camera of the actor to where you would actually see who the actor is at the keyboard. Believe it or not, the Republic of Georgia did this. They were able to put malware in files before they were stolen by actors, and they were able to basically film the actor sitting there and use that as evidence in when they found the actor to prosecute the actor. So that would be one way to try to find attribution, which is very uh, unusual. The other way, which I talked about a little earlier, is the idea of using beacons or some sort of signaling device that you would embed in the malware prior to being stolen that would then allow you to track the location of that. And the beacons uh, are one element, again, of the task force. They've mentioned that in two different ways. Uh, so I do uh, list planting beacons as a potential outside the network, which is obviously at the lower scale of any offensive type actions. Um, so there are some limited ways, I think, to do attribution. But really what I'm looking at in the book is the damage, limiting the damage. In other words, getting the files back in some ways. Uh, uh, there are some ways to retaliate, uh, but I try to steer away from that. And because the law, of course, is very limited in this matter. Hopefully that answers. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. I'm retired. And uh, I was wondering, most, if uh, probably most of these attacks are enabled by users doing something they shouldn't do, right. responding to a phishing email or clicking on a link. And I know uh, the mail system I use tells me the official from address, but it also allows me to see the uh, actual from address where they differ. And it's possible for these mailing systems to actually compare the two and put out a warning saying this doesn't match. And it's also possible, for example, f uh, for a company to put a system on their browsers where if something looks questionable, when someone clicks on a link, an alert comes up saying, uh, this link is being, this click is being uh, logged. This is a dangerous thing. Your career may be endangered if you continue. Do you want to continue? Has anybody looked into user education and possible safeguards like that? Well, that's a great question because it really lends to the need for active cyber defense. So what you're talking about is that human tendency will be to click on that link, to look at that, that picture, that file, uh, for curiosity. And there's quite a number of studies that are done by companies. They do surveys. They, they track this. And something like 1 in 12, uh, about 1 in 25 would open the email. 1 in 12 would actually open the link. OK? So uh, you, you can't get around that. And, and the point being is that you know most uh, senior officials, like Admiral Rogers, would say, it, you're going to be penetrated. It's just a matter of when. And that's why. It's, it's one reason why. So you're talking now about defense in depth type solutions, trying to come up with ways to train the, uh, the user to avoid those links, ways to put those banners in, ways to use maybe sandboxing that, that sandboxes the link before you open it. So those are defense in depth techniques. And uh, so I cover uh, many of those in the book, uh, but I reached the conclusion they're just not sufficient. I mean, the actors are in the systems and other industry sources who have done implanted sensors inside companies will find, oh my God, they're, they're hacked already. I mean, we just got here and there's all kinds of activity inside the network. There's outbound command and control communication already ongoing. So uh, I agree that there are many things that can be done and should be done in order to reduce the concurrences. However, they're still insufficient. We need something in acting inside a network to, to see the activity of the actor. answer that. Great question. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so we've talked about, we've talked a lot about uh, peacetime. Uh, I'm Mike Muller, I'm a Heritage Foundation intern. Um, we've talked a lot about peacetime deterrence and stuff like that. Um, but what about wartime deterrence? So how do you stop uh, a nation state from attacking another nation state critical infrastructure, um, like their electricity grid or something like that, um, through a cyber attack? Um, you know, we have norms and procedures to not use nuclear weapons, but a uh, attack on our critical infrastructure could be just as dangerous. So how would you deter that? Right, so, uh, well, 
starting with norms of responsible behavior and critical infrastructure, the, uh, the 2015 United Nations Government Group of Experts uh, does discuss as one of their norms uh, re restraining from attacks on critical infrastructure. The, the real question is, will states adhere to those norms? And the problem today, in peacetime at least, is that uh, they don't have any motivation to do that. They can deny the attack. So if you look at, as I do in the book, the attack on the Russian power plant, on the Ukrainian power plant uh, in December of a year ago, uh, it was uh, assumed that Russia did it because of Ukraine. And of course, their relationship is, is, is uh, skeptical but, uh, or tenuous. But, uh, but it was still very difficult to say it was a state actor that did that. Okay, and, and for sure, there were criminal activity, many of the industry experts have said, leading up to the attack. So the point being is there, there are norms saying we should not attack critical infrastructure. Okay, and, and folks such as Russia, nation states, help build those norms. But they have the ability to act with impunity, deniability, uh, and they might do it anyway. So in peacetime, there are challenges in that. In wartime, uh, as I put in the book, when I, when I looked at the... Uh, the retaliation chapter, I actually go through, again, uh, resort to conflict and in conflict, the two conditions of that under legal terms. And I started looking at the very distinction, the, the areas of proportionality and so forth, uh, distinction and the other uh, international law terms uh, that would restrict behavior. The problem, again, is are you going to play by those rules? The United States does. The United States says we will abide by the law of armed conflict in all cyber operations in and out of wartime. The question would be, would other states abide by the law of armed conflict in, in conflict itself that you're describing? So uh, I, I cover all those conditions, I should say, in the book, those legal conditions. Uh, but then it's up to the states to follow it in, in armed conflict, as you're alluding to. Thank you. Yes, Paul, please. and Swag, George Washington University, and Heritage. Um, question. One of the major deterrents to the adoption of active cyber defense by American companies, at least at the corporate level, is not so much just American legal prohibitions, but legal prohibitions in other nations, uh, where uh, unlike hackers, they, are not, they don't have legal impunity. Right? Uh, they have a plant in Germany or something like that. Um, what's your suggestion or solution, if any, for resolving uh, that risk such that they can act with a beaconing uh, or the camera in Germany or in France, I I some nation where they might suffer adverse consequences for violations of the domestic law of the targeted country? Right. Well, uh, again, I spoke with Paul before the event, and I'd like to commend him for the piece that he wrote uh, here on 5 May. And we talked about that, and, and you mentioned that, Paul, of course, in the piece about national law. Uh, in the book, what I did is, is I recognized that there are national laws in play. Uh, I used, for example, the CFAA as the United States approach. So I did not at all, of course, discount other national laws. I did not have the opportunity or the bandwidth to cover other countries, such as you refer in, in Germany, and I think you put that in your article, which I appreciate. Uh, this is the matter, then, of some sort of protection. Uh, and in the thinking of active cyber defense, whether or not we can operate under a legal umbrella, a legal framework that does make sense. Uh, I offer the exemptions to the CFAA. Uh, Zach West, uh, uh, I cite him in there for that as a prospect, Okay, using the same authority that our law enforcement would have. So whatever law, law enforcement authority would be to have to operate in Germany, we would put the private companies, licensed, certified companies, under that same exemption. The challenge is, is that good enough? I don't know. So therefore, in the book, I wrote an appendix that has policies and priorities, and I identified the need to clearly run that down, the need to establish a legal framework that decides whether that's adequate or not. So the lawyers can debate that and then take that forward. So the appendix of the book uh, has all those, quote, suggestions, those roll-ups for that action to be taken. I just set the stage for it. So great question and a great article. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Noah Bidna from the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. Um, we represent a lot of different industries and companies who are working with new developing technologies. Um, so I just had a question on the automated defense systems and how flexible it's going to be for specifically autonomous vehicles and all those new developing technologies that we really can't fathom in the next five or ten years. Right. So the developing technologies that I'm talking about that I identify more by name are what are called EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response Solutions. And that is an industry term that I cite with the examples that I give. And, and I will say, I mentioned Palette Networks, uh, Magna. In the book, I mentioned other companies. And I, again, I'm not endorsing the companies, but I talk about Carbon Black, Tripwire, and CrowdStrike as three other examples because they have different variations of an EDR solution. And I thought it would be important to talk about the spectrum of those solutions. Uh, EDR is becoming the industry term. And when I was at RSA, which is the annual security conference in San Francisco about four months ago, almost every vendor is now promoting their version of EDR solution. So I don't think that it's going to be difficult, uh, and, I, and it will be very soon, and I appreciate your term five years. Uh, I think it'll be very uh, quicker than that in order to get these into industry, into government, and so forth. And that goes back to the project I'm doing with John Hopkins is to try to get that framework into government critical infrastructure. Meanwhile, corporations today that attend those security vendor expos like at RSA can see the whole range of solutions that are readily available. The question, of course, is that they really work, okay? And, uh, and that's what I'm trying to dive into. Do they really work? Can they defeat all types of attack vectors across the kill chain? That's my next project. But I lay the foundation for that in the book, how you would, look, how you would examine that. So I think the solution is going to be there pretty quick, and if you can buy it, it'll be there quicker. Fair enough? Good. Thanks, Mel. Hey, Tony Glossman, Drinker, Middle and Reef. Tony, welcome. <laughs> Tony was one of my lawyers that I referred to in the book, and it's great to see you here, Tony. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me about um, active defense is, is this uh, potential for positive externalities for um, firms with the means to use active defense potentially benefiting um, because of norms or actions they've taken, um, firms or actors that don't have those means. Um, and one of the themes that you've hit on a couple of times is this um, command and control communications. And, and I, I wonder whether there are, or whether you've seen um, instances in which um, in general could benefit um, control um, nodes or endpoints um, when, they, when they're detected and what that would mean for firm, but um, kind of more broadly um, the network. Um, in right. So Tony, uh, if I hear the question right, then you're, you're, you're basically talking about going outside the network to disable a command and control node outside the network. So uh, again, uh, from a, from a legal uh, aspect, I, I use that self-defense, defense and defense of property aspect. And the question would probably beg, how far do you go in order to defend your property? Okay, so if you can block the command and control communication, then that might be good enough, all right? And some of the technologies, as I mentioned, Light Cyber says, well, we would have blocked it in WannaCry. Well, if I knew the command and control channel, the IP, I could have blocked it through cyber threat intelligence and defense in depth, too. So I would say the, the limits there would be on the intent. If the intent is to defend your property, I don't necessarily need to go outside and do what you're describing. Now, some companies might feel the impel, uh, 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 encouraged to do that, or they might feel compelled to do it, is the term I would use. And, uh, and I think you even gave, the, I cited in the book, some examples where companies maybe have done some of that work, and then work with law enforcement. But I would probably say at that point, once again, okay, am I a licensed uh, private firm working under the authority of, say, law enforcement? Now they're telling me to go ahead and do that because they want the attribution in order to arrest somebody. And they have the capacity. So I think the argument that's being built in the book is that the private sector has the capacity. They have the smart people. Why don't we use some of those smart people in this arrangement in order to help law enforcement? We can't get to these acts that are below the threshold. This is another big point. These acts like uh, ransomware are below the threshold of government involvement, to be honest. Uh, so the actors are on their own. 
And most of them, as, as you well know, are taking their own initiative. If we don't address this problem in some fashion, legal frameworks, open debate with congressmen, whatever it might be, the, they'll just go ahead and adopt the capabilities themselves, some of the corporations. And they'll start going outside of networks, and surveys say they already are. So we need to have a more reg, a regulated regime and arrangement. Wait, is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Good seeing you. Uh, Jason Greenfield from Congressman Schweikert's office. You mentioned that sometimes these these bad actors they steal information, but they can't actually get paid for them because bitcoins and such they're they're so public now these days that we could trace that back to them. So using bitcoins technology and similar products like Zcash, Ethereum, things like that in, in this blockchain and distributed ledgers that we have, how do you think that technology can kind of transform the online platform so that when we have payments? everyone can trust them and we can all see them. So can we kind of rule out hacking anymore if, if we have that technology there? And how do you think that could progress in the coming years? You're, you're talking about using Bitcoin for uh, public consumption and having uh, ledger tracking, correct? Correct. Right. Well, uh, correct. So in, in WannaCry, they only gave uh, three addresses to send the Bitcoin. And uh, it's you could actually... Go to one of the addresses if you were smart enough, and the fellow that I was talking to sat there with his laptop and did, and could say, oh, well, there's $54,000 that have been paid to this address, okay? And uh, supposedly, again, there's some sort of a computer flaw, which I don't understand the description of, that would then allow that payout to be traced if you tried to cash in. And that's why the actors haven't cashed it in, because then would, you'd see, well, they're trying to cash into this bank, and we'd alert the bank and, and stop the transaction which credit card companies do, as an example. You know, the, really the question on Bitcoin and, and ledgers is really uh, computational power. I mean, in order to generate uh, the ledger, in order to track the transactions, uh, it, it takes a lot of computational power. And so we mine Bitcoin in order to produce the computational power. So Bitcoin then would be more of a closed market uh, with somewhat of a limit as to its currency that's, that's allowed to be transacted. In order to replicate Bitcoin across, say, your bank accounts, where I can track my ledgers through some sort of Bitcoin solution, uh, from my understanding, it would take tremendous computing, computing power because it tracks every transaction that the Bitcoin goes through. So it's not like I pay a dollar for gasoline and then somebody else takes that dollar, walks out of the store when they when I give them change for a bag, buying a bag of Cheetos, right? Now I know where that dollar went. You know, I paid for it, and they went to them. It's in their pocket. You're talking about tracing that dollar through the life of that dollar, okay, through a Bitcoin transaction. Imagine how many times a dollar passes hands in the life of a dollar. I have no idea. But the point being is I think that would be one of the tech hurdles in Bitcoin for my rudimentary understanding of Bitcoin. Anybody have a comment on that that studied Bitcoin more than me? But, but that's a good question, and it's come up often. Why don't we just track the transactions? I've, had it, I've heard it being debated before, so very good. Uh, hello, my uh, name is Ula Wojciechowska, and I am Board Certified Behavior Analyst. Um, I've noticed that in your book you also examine the motivations of those actors. Right. So from behavioral point of view, I just would like to hear a little bit more because you did mention that money is not the motivating um, reinforcer. So from behavioral point of view, I would like to know what other motivators uh, are being powerful so that they maintain the behavior of those actors to engage in um, that activity. Uh, if you can elaborate on that, I would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, well, the one that comes to mind is patriotic hackers in that category of hacker groups that I allude to. And throughout the book, I refer to a number of the instances where patriotic hackers have been used, such as the attacks on Estonia in 2007, the attacks on the Republic of Georgia in 2008, the ability of uh, forums to be established for patriotic hackers to basically download instructions, malware, and so forth. Uh, we also see this, of course, in Anonymous. Uh, I mentioned that in the book as another hacker group which has used that same sort of uh, motivational, more of an ideological 
motivation. So I look at probably those two as the motivation for the general populace to get engaged in, a, in an attack. And, and then that really starts to speak to deterrence. What's the problem there? Well, if I have thousands of individual citizens participating in an attack, what do you do now? Okay. You, are you going to go arrest them? All right. Are you going to basically block their computers, which they're maybe generating from a botnet? And then, of course, there's unknowing actors like your computer at home that's part of a botnet. Probably one in four in the United States is, so yours very well might be. So, so looking at motivations of other actors and how does that factor into deterrence? And how do you defeat then the attack? Uh, the book is really about defeating the attack. Okay, uh, It talks about the fact, well, can I trace it back, attribute it to the actor who generated those attacks? But, but, in, but at the end of the day, I want to block the attack. I want to prevent the damage from being done, OK? Uh, and then we'll sort the rest out later in some regard. Let's stop the damage. So I think, yes, uh, looking at motivations, those are a couple of the cases that I would use. All right, thank you. Dave Rubinowitz again. Uh, you just mentioned botnets. And I'm right. wondering if anybody has actually looked at uh, legal ramifications or such of actually going after the computers that are parts of botnets and uh, requiring that the people clean up their computers somehow. Uh, well, you know, there's there's a there's initiatives. For example, DHS has. I'll actually be out at DHS this afternoon. Uh, you know, they run campaigns, uh, uh, public awareness campaigns, cyber awareness months, and so forth. So uh, I don't necessarily hit that in the book. But I've worked with those sort of agencies that, that attempt to educate the general public, you know, to the dangers of what you're saying, not cleaning up your computer. Every time I run a malware scan on my computer, I find infections that, are, that become isolated. So uh, that's definitely a strategy uh, through public-private partnerships. Uh, and if I look at deterrence by denial, uh, that should be part of the effort. But again, uh, it's very difficult to reduce those numbers. And, uh, and there's still plenty out there to be used as part of botnets, you know, compromised computers. Uh, so I, I think you have great ideas here going back to the individual citizens, and, and it's part of the effort. Yes, it is. We're, we're, we're good. We could go all day, Riley. You're more than welcome to come up and talk with Scott afterwards. But I know your timeline is right there. I appreciate that. Yeah, some powwow a little bit. Um, Good. I'll stick around. So uh, the book, The Strategic Deterrence, uh, it will be available in a couple weeks. Uh, right. We have forms outside if you'd like to pre-order it as well. But uh, with that, I'd like to close and give Scott a hand. Thanks a lot, Rob.